So I think that is all from me and we're ready to go. Joe, if you're happy to unmute and start your camera, we'll have you join us and yourself, Hannah. Absolutely. Lovely, welcome ladies. Thank you. Over to you. Okay. Fantastic. So I'm going to just find, or maybe I'm going to find. Good. Okay. So good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us on this very warm evening here in the UK. And I gather it's the same in Lisbon, which is where Anna Sophia is based. Um, Anna Sophia, thank you so much for joining us. It's a, it's a great pleasure to see you again. I haven't seen you face to face in person, that is since the beginning of last year, I think, um, when, I, when you were in London. I've known Anna Sophia for many years. She's worked with Portuguese wines for many years, um, often coming over to the UK. Um, and so I thought it would be super to, um, to chat with her. And we've managed to get most of the wines to her as well, um, so that we can actually go through the wines together. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to, we've got a few slides that will take us through Portugal and take us through this small selection of wines. And some of you may have some of the wines uh, or even all of the wines. Um, and we basically, we opted for a selection of whites, all of which are blended. Now you could say, oh, that's a terrible omission. We haven't got an Alvarinho in particular, um, but we, we went for a limited number of wines, but even across those four wines and then a white port, we're managing to cover 12 of Portugal's indigenous grape varieties. And then there's one international interloper, the Chardonnay grape, which appears uh, in the last of the whites that we're going to be looking at. Um, so we'll touch on the grapes as we go. We'll touch on the regions as we go. It's going to be very informal, hopefully very conversational. Um, so please do send us in your questions. And if there's something that's pertinent to what we're chatting about at the time, Catherine and, and the team will, will let us know. Um, and so a big thank you also to Anna Sophia because she sent us some lovely images as well. But we're going to start with a map just so that we can situate. Hopefully that will appear like magic. Um, oh my God. No. So shortly we will have a map. <laughs> just bear with us, Joe. We'll just get that loaded for you. Okay. Okay. And um, ah, here we go. Okay. So we've got a nice clear map of Portugal. Now I'm sure you all know that that Portugal is that really quite small, narrow. Um, narrow north-south strip on the far Atlantic coast uh, of Europe. Um, and as you will see, much of, much of Portugal, uh, much of the coastline and many of the wine regions are actually influenced by that coastline. And we're starting with, um, now I don't know whether my, is, is my, my mouse actually showing on screen there? Or does somebody, ah, there you go. Yes, it is, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So. We're starting with a wine from the Vigna Verde region, which is on the northwest coast of Portugal. So very much influenced by the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and it's the region itself is known as the Minho, although we, we tend to, we often call it the Vigna Verde region, but really that's the, that's the wine. And it's literally just south of the border with Spain. And it shares some of the same grape varieties as Spain. Um, and I think we've got, we've got a couple of images, have we, of the region? Shall we skip on to those? Yeah, so this is a really, a really nice one that I think it, it shows the sort of the greenness that you get here, but there's also a mist in the background. It can be quite a wet area, can't it, Anasphere? It is, it is, it is very, um, it is quite wet and that's why it's so green. And that's why it's called Vigno Verde because it has as you may know, so verde means, means green, of course. And it's not because the grapes are green or, you know, they're not ripe or it's nothing to do with that. It has to do really because with the region and the region is really green because it rains quite a lot. Um, and so this, this particular uh, uh, picture really shows, you know, how, 
how yeah the mist as you were saying it's quite, it's quite misty and it can be quite humid um mm-hmm. so it's and that's why as well i don't know if you've you've, you've seen these images of you know that we call them ramada it's when the basically the vine is is uh, is uh, vertical and grows a lot and is far away from from the the ground um, just so it doesn't get too humid and it doesn't damage the the grapes. So that was the traditional way of growing of growing the wine. And some winemakers are a bit back to it and 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 using these uh, these sorts okay. of old old techniques. Yeah, well, that's interesting because it, you know you you might think that with that humidity that there is that there would be a lot of disease pressure in the vineyard, and I'm sure I'm sure there that is sometimes an issue. But also because it's on the Atlantic coast, you do get good air circulation, which is a huge, a huge advantage. Yes, uh, that's exactly it. That's a nice picture. I don't know if you've ever been to. Um, so that's um, a city called Amarante, uh, Amarant. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a beautiful, be- beautiful, uh, small, small city. And completely surrounded by by Vino Verde, I mean, by vineyards, and uh, it's it's obviously a place where food is quite important as well, and very typical and traditional traditional Portuguese Portuguese meat, mainly meat. Even if we are close to the Atlantic, uh, these regions, because because there is a bit of altitude as well, so it's 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 um it's it's a it's not really the life of, you know, like uh, by the sea, I would say it's more the life, you know, not in the mountains, but almost, you know, it's a bit more close up. And so the food is a bit more, um, I don't know, we yeah, have meaty and, you know, more, more based on, on, on meat. Um, I, re- I really love Amarante. It's actually a, a beautiful, beautiful place. Beautiful I must admit, I've never been there. So I must make a, I must make a point of, of going there. Next time. <laughs> and, and it's interesting you talk about meat, the, the, um, uh, one of, in fact, I think it was probably the first time that I ate octopus was in this region, and it was quite a meaty, meaty dish. It was a, it was you know, big piece of octopus. It was actually very good. It was quite an experience, but it was very good. Um, you know that it's interesting yes. you say that because two of our traditional fishy dishes is actually so it's octopus. You're right, mm-hmm. and codfish, of course. And both of them, we actually, we used to say that they are meat. So they are, they are, they are fish, but they are definitely meat. And, and that we should drink them with red wines instead of white or with certain whites and not, uh, and not the, the whites that we, we may have in mind. Because, because as you say, yeah, and because we cook them, you know, in a really meaty way, actually, you know, in the yes. oven and, and so, yeah, and then that, that's right. Octopus is quite an experience. And I remember when I used to, um, well to get you know international journalists to Portugal and to tour with them uh, it was always a challenge you know to have the first time they, they were eating there or having octopus it's not easy <laughs> no exactly <laughs> should we have a look at our wine so the wine we're tasting for those of you who don't have it um, is a vineyard from a producer called Soliero which is um, who are based right up in the north of the region um, Melgasso, yeah. Yeah, uh, small premium producer. Um, and this this is a delightful wine. It's a, it's a to, to describe it as an entry point wine is not really very accurate because it's not least because it's 1095 a bottle, but it's, I think it's, their, it's, it's probably their first wine. Um, and it's a wine, we've had a similar wine in the past which they made, which they bottled with Dirk Nieport, actually, called Docile, yes. which was also very light in alcohol. So this is 11 and a half alcohol um, from a top producer of the grape. Now, Soliero is, is known for the Alvarino grape, which is the same as Albarino in Spain, just over the border. Um, but in this case, it's a blend, and it's actually majority Durero, uh, which typically comes from a little further south in the region. It comes from the Ponta de Lima uh, area, a bit further south. Um, so this is 70% Lorero and 30% Alvarino. And it's just a delight. I mean, Vino Verde is, is such a delightful, uh, fragrant and fresh drink anyway, just perfect for this time of year, for this hot weather, beautifully chilled. 
Yeah, and um, as you were saying, Joe, uh, uh, yeah, Soyer, sorry, sorry to interrupt, yeah. No, Soyer, I mean, it is such an amazing family brand, very well known in Portugal as well, producing, you know, these fantastic wines. And they really, I can really say, I think they put uh, this sub-region on the map of quality white wines in Portugal. So they are really a, an important mark and really a, a, a family, you know, working very, very well on that type, working for a long time because I think the father started in the late 70s or mid 70s. Uh -huh. So that's, uh, that's an amazing, um, amazing people, amazing family uh, working all together, um, brother and sister nowadays uh, with the mother still involved. So um, I, re I really love the work because they, they, again, as you were saying, it is, it is a, a, a really enjoyable wine, uh, easy, easy to drink, uh, but with so much quality. I mean, even if you are, and you are, you know, a wine lover and you want to get a, some, something extra, you can really get it, I think, with this precise wine and with all the wines that they produce. So I, I love it. It's, it's great. Yeah. <clears throat> the last time I visited them, which is now, gosh, it must be two, probably three years ago, um, we tasted this wine and then I carried on doing other visits and it was the first time actually that my husband and daughter came out to meet me. So I was there for about 10 days and they came out to meet me in Lisbon. We had a very short weekend together in Lisbon flight times just happened to work so they could fly in on the Saturday morning and fly out on the Sunday afternoon it was perfect and we uh, we had a bottle of this wine at the the timeout market in Lisbon I don't know whether that still exists but it was a really fun place. yeah yeah it does of course yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well worth uh, looking up if you go to Lisbon which I would highly recommend that's that's true and something also maybe we could we could say is that Usually, people expect Vigno Verde to be fizzy or, or extra fizzy or slightly fizzy, you know, and and which which is not mandatory at all. Um, so so it's it's a it's a style that that is chosen. So you you can, you can feel the, all the citrus note and how light it is, but but without having the um, the fizzy side that you can find in in, in other Vigno Verde uh, uh, whites. So it, it's a it's a it's a it's a, a choice of the producer choosing the style that they they want to they want to have, and so Soleiro is more on this on this yeah. uh, style. And, and would you say it 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 feels to me that generally, the higher up the quality scale you go, and the higher up the price ladder you go, the less likely you are to find that. Certainly, any yeah. of spritz, you might find just the slightest prickle. You know, a lot of a lot of white wines have a have a little bit of CO2 in them. So it's it's almost imperceptible. Uh, whereas it's the it's the bigger commercial uh, wines, the less expensive wines, where you will have a more obvious slight spritz. And they're both delicious. That you know, they're both good. Um, different styles, yeah, different exactly. styles, eventually for different occasions. Uh, but for people who don't really enjoy, you know, the the, the fizzy side on on, on wines, uh, there are now more and more options. Um, from Vigno Verde without, without that. So it, they are just, you know, really crisp uh, uh, white wines. And, and obviously the region is able to produce this, this type of, 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 of crispiness, let's say that other regions might struggle uh, in Portugal. So, um, so yeah, no, that's, that's, but you're right, obviously. Yeah, the, the, the more expensive and the more quality, let's say, um, uh, usually producers choose not to, to, to have CO2, yeah. And just before we leave Vignaved, I don't know, Catherine, whether there are any any questions very pertinent to this bit of the discussion. Whether there's anything we need to address now. We nearly had one, and it was um, oh. it was about the, how whether it should have a fizz or oh, not. Okay, just as I was about Excellent. to appear. Excellent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I okay. knew it. You see, I can I can even predict questions now. That's good. <laughs> And um, yeah, just before we leave Vigna Verde, we've, um, many of you know that we have a, our own blind tasting competition that we do every year and the winners come through in our offers, our offer in July, which this year it's July, which we call our wine champions. And we have successes in Vigna Verde again this year. I think there are two Vigna Verde that came through as winners this year. So uh, 
look out for those in a few weeks' time. Okay, shall we move on to the, the next region and the next wine? That's brilliant. Okay, so the next wine we're moving to is the Douro White, I believe. So we're still quite north in Portugal. Uh, the Douro River runs from the east uh, on the border with, with Spain, um, almost, almost sort of uh, horizontally out into the sea at, at Porto. Um, and between what this map doesn't show is that between the coast and the region, uh, there are mountains which actually protect the region quite a lot from the incoming Atlantic weather. Um, and we're, we're about to see the, the spectacular scenery for nobody who, for anybody who hasn't been there. It is certainly one of the most spectacular wine regions in the world. Um, so here you have a typical picture of the river. Sometimes it's straighter than that, but it does meander quite a lot. Um, and you can see that the vineyards tend to come right down, in some cases, right, right down to the, close to the river. And they can be very, very steep. It's not so obvious how steep they are here, but we have another picture, I think, where it just shows you just how steep they can be. And, and these are, you can see the terraced vineyards, which take a huge amount of, of maintenance. And this is, that was the wonderful old steam train, which I don't know, does that still run, the steam train? Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can, uh, you can buy, you can, you can uh, buy a trip. No, no, it's great. It's an amazing, it's an amazing trip to, to do because you are by the river. So you have on one side the river, on the other side the vines. It's magic. Um, and what what I think is 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 really magical about about the Douro is, I think it's because, and actually, you know, I did, I never realized that before. I, I was just preparing a little bit for, for this, you know, session. And the Douro is actually, Douro and Porto, you know, uh, region is actually the biggest in Portugal. So it's 42,000 hectares, which means, but when you look at the map, you can see that it's quite small. So it means that you have vineyards absolutely everywhere. And I think it's obviously part of the, of, of the magic and of, of, you know, it's impossible to be in the Douro and not have a, you know, see a vineyard somewhere. Um, so it's it's a, it's it's really it really is a, a special a special place, um, and obviously all the conditions uh, if if winemakers do their job and they they know how to do it because it's uh, it's um, the, the the oldest demarcated region and and you know with all the rules uh, uh, in the world, so uh, obviously they know what they're doing and and with all these conditions it's. Obviously, the wines that come out of these regions are special, I would say, or, or of high quality. I think it's, it's a, a fascinating region as well because it produces um, the amazing contrasting styles. So this evening, we're tasting a light, dry white wine. And the white grapes tend to be planted higher up the slopes. So they come from those higher lying vineyards which is how you get the freshness in the grapes. Um, made all from local grapes, so which again are adapted to the climate. So the, the white wines will be planted high. Um, and then you have the same, broadly speaking, the same red grapes are used for the red table wines and for the ports, but the port grapes very often will come from lower down in the, the hotter parts of the, of the valley of the vineyards. Um, yeah. as, closer down to the sea. So it's it's absolutely fascinating, those different, you know, the terraces and the kind of steps of, of the, uh, of how the planting is, is laid out. And it's interesting as well as, you know, how winemakers have been studying and using the, the height as well, because I think it's a, it's a huge factor. And because, because in the Douro, you can go up to six or 700 meters uh, altitude. So it can really, as you were saying, make a difference in, in uh, and sort of help you get the stuff profile that you are looking for with a bit of more freshness. You know, the Douro in, in summer can easily, easily go up to 45 degrees easily during the day. And it doesn't really go down. Uh, and because the soil is shift, so it keeps all the, all this, you know, heat and um, all this, yeah, during the day. So it's it's a it's a very challenging for the for the vines actually, and that, and that's why 
that's why there's concentration. That's why there's there are so many you know specific flavors in in the in the Doro wines. But I particularly love this this project that that you you selected to show because I think it's uh, it's such a um, such a, a smart but at the same time meaningful project. I would say you know the mm -hmm. the the Feituria the Feituria. So, um, I'm going to, I'm I'm going to, show, the, I'm going to yeah. show the label. I don't know whether people will be able to see it, but it, I love the, the way they've used the illustration. It's a beautiful illustration of a ring of bees, which represent the 18 farmers who are involved in this particular project. So it's a, it's, it's a shared, um, it's like a small cooperative really. Um, 18 producers, 19 quintas, so somebody's obviously lucky enough to have two. Um, yeah. And I think Fitoria is the word for an old, for a shared winery, I read? And, well, uh, no, so Fitoria no, okay. is actually, no, I don't think so. So Fitoria is actually the word, so basically when the region was demarcated, so a long time ago by, by Merkir de Pombal, so basically he decided to, to uh, and, it's, and, and there is a story uh, between Portugal and the UK, because obviously, I mean, the, the, the relationship and, and, and all the story with the Douro and, 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 and the UK is, is huge. So basically, Feituria is actually the name we give to um, the stones that used to separate and, and create the limitation between the parcels where wines, where, 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 well, where, where there were vines with good quality or with quality enough to produce wines that then will be would be exported, so only the wines or the vines that were in between these marks that that they still exist. So they are big, big. Actually, I should have sent you a picture. So they are big stones, and a few of them are still in place in the Douro. So a few producers have them, and so there are these big stones, uh, uh, rectangular stones that basically demarcated the region. And so only the grapes coming from this specific vineyard were thought to have quality enough to be exported to the UK, which that was ma mainly, I mean, only the UK at the time. So it is, it is obviously a great name. And as you were saying, so this project is like a co-op with the difference that the producers are the owners of the co-op, of the, co of the company. Mm -hmm. So then they don't only uh, sell you know the the, um, the the grapes they actually own the company and the last quinta that they just bought a year ago is actually a quinta that they all bought together so basically each one of them has a quinta or two as you mentioned because there are more more quintas than uh, so, so more estates than than producers and the last one they decided to buy to buy it all together so it's uh it is, it is, and it is, I mean, it is always challenging to work, you know, as a huge group like that, because 15, you know, producers is, is quite a lot. But um, at the same time, I think the project is so, yeah, meaningful. I think it's because obviously the reality of the Doro is a lot of very, very small producers who would, would struggle to actually well, yes. be able, yeah, to be able to to bottle and and have as a wine and and market it and export it. So yes. they joined forces and and um and and it's been it's been existing this project for quite a long time now. I'm not precisely sure, but I think maybe is it fifteen or fifteen years, maybe some something like that. I don't have that information in front of me, and I can't can't honestly remember. But it's certainly been a while no. because I've been. Yes the wines on and off for, for quite a few years yeah. yeah so so i think it's um again i mean i think that the the management and and all the idea of, of of this project is is absolutely is absolutely fantastic so lavradores which is a quite a difficult name to pronounce even even for us lavradores means means producer i would say or people who work on the on the ground and feituria then is is you know is, is this um this tone um, which is it's very very impressive to uh, to see um, and obviously they are a mark of the quality so yes. only quality quality vines would 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 be surrounded by by these stones so um, I love that I've never so, heard yeah. that story and then I have to say it's it's a um, they're very modern as well it's a screw cap top 
which is perfect for this style of wine, I think. Um, no, it's a lovely one. And this, this gives us uh, three more grapes. So in this wine, we have Malvasia Fina, Viozinho, and Codega. Apologies for my pronunciation, if I haven't got those right. Um, oh, all good, perfect. Really, really <laughs> Portugal has such a long tradition of blending grape varieties, um, all of which contribute to the blend. Some will have more acidity, some less acidity, some are more aromatic, some are just very crisp and mineral, and they all contribute to the successful blend, if you like. And it's, it's one of those... I don't know whether it's it's particularly important in the Douro where you have such extreme conditions as well, whereby it's a little bit of an insurance policy. Some years one grape variety will do better than others, but also often they'll ripen at slightly different times. So one variety might ripen a little earlier and, then, and miss the autumn rains. So you have this, this long tradition um, which works very successfully. Yeah, we, we, we say, we say uh, I mean, we sort of, say to ourselves or to the world, to wh whoever wants to hear that, that we are masters of blends. And I think it is true because we, so we work with more than 250 native grapes in Portugal. Um, and the tradition, I mean, a long, long time ago, and with some wines that are old vines, the tradition was to plant all the different grapes all together, precisely because of what you were saying, because because the idea already at the time was that some grapes would give some more acidity, other grapes would give freshness, other grapes would give structure, whatever. And so they were all mixed together on the field, on the soil, and then they would be picked all, all together like a hundred years ago. Uh, and so we still have some old vines planted precisely like that. Ob obviously nowadays winemakers uh, um, want to work in the winery. So they plant diff the different grapes separately they harvest in different times and then they blend um they they, they blend in the in the winery uh, to get precisely what the, the profile they, they want uh, it's it's such a hard work i mean i remember visiting california oh my god 10 years ago and i remember because obviously most of the time they work with one grape only mm -hmm. and i remember the winemaker saying I have some, whatever, Merlot or whatever it was, um, in this American uh, barrel, American oak barrel. Uh, and then I have the same Merlot, I mean, the same grape in another cask and I blend and I blend the two. And I was thinking, yes, of course, because for them to blend is just to sort of what they can do with the wood or, you know, with the barrel. Obviously we have a, such a, an amazing playground because with all these grapes, obviously not all produce, not all producers have all the grapes, but but they certainly have more than five, 10, 15 for sure, even, I mean, usually more. And so and even if it's just a little bit, they, they play with it and they know precisely what these grapes will bring to the, to the mix. So I know it's a bit, I know, I mean, I know because I, I work in the UK for quite a few years now and, and I know how scary Portuguese wines sometimes can be because there's no grape on the label and people do recognize grapes most of the time. So it's, it's, it's been quite a challenge for Portuguese wines to actually explain uh, the profile, what they are, what they have to sell. So I think the region is a, good, is, is a good way to go because you will find similar characteristics inside a precise region. Vigno Verde, which is not a region, it's a deal, but I mean, the Vigno Verde style, the Doro style, so you can start uh, like that and, and, and without, without it being too risky. So, um, so that's, but, but, but I can understand it's a challenge, even for us, I mean, I drink wine, I mean, I know most of Portuguese wines, but still I, have, I, I discover things every day because, because, because it's, but there's no limit really to the to what they can create i suppose so it's yes. amazing exactly Good. and of course think it, it it becomes even more complicated because sometimes grapes are called different names in different parts of portugal yes which doesn't have to be poor we poor english anyway <laughs> 
I know, I know. But anyway, it's complicated for us as well. So, you know, so, yeah. Okay, we should probably move on. Did we do the, did we finish with the Dora pictures? We have, yes, but we've had a question come in from Paul Whitman oh, okay. while we're talking about the Douro. Mm. And he said that they um, they visited a wine producing kinta in the Douro where they were told that the grapes were all pressed by human foot. Is that a general practice or is it something that's just quite traditional and perhaps moving away from a bit more now with wine production? Well, I mean, Joe, you, you know that, huh? you, you know that it's, it's very, it's very traditional uh, in Portugal, not only in the door, actually. Uh, uh, it's very traditional and it is something that almost all the, the winemakers will tell you that it's impossible to replace. So there are a few machines uh, sort of trying to replicate the movement of, uh, of, of human uh, feet. Mm -hmm. But um, but they say that it's very that the the feet are more delicate in the way that they wouldn't um, how do you say they wouldn't um, press the um, pip, pips is it the name yes it? yeah they don't they don't crush the pips because if you if you break the pip then you release some of the bitter characteristics you know whereas your your foot will it would it would uh, you would tread on the pit but you wouldn't break it. Whereas machinery, the risk is that machinery could, could damage the pit. I mean, I think there are still a few of the, of the big pork producers who um, tread the grapes by foot. And quite a lot of producers, especially some of the niche fine red wine producers, will be treading by foot. I wouldn't imagine many, if any people, would be working white wines that way because, I mean, maybe if a few if you're making port, but mostly I would think the what you want to do there is really keep the freshness. Um, yes, yes. Sorry, I, I didn't get too much the chat. Of course, it, it, of course, the question was for maybe for white. I didn't hear that. Yes, of course. No, I, I don't. I don't know any white wine that wouldn't be would be treated like no, no, no. It's only reds and ports, obviously. Uh, but again, not not only in the Douro. So it, it is something. So we we. Uh, we do that in in in, in big uh, lagares, we call them. So this sort of rectangular, uh, um, um, how do you say, stone uh, place, uh, granite, granitic. It's a bit granite uh, most of the time, um, and it's a spectacular thing to do. And and, and and there are, I think, reasons to use it and to do it. But but it's uh, but no 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 for not for white. No for sure. No no no. I just I just spotted another question on the same subject, which are people's feet examined before they tread the grapes? <laughs> Actually, I expect I expect that, and certainly my experience. I've done it once, um, which was a wonderful experience, great fun. Um, yeah. But so my experience was that we our legs and feet were hosed down, but that was as much to remove any dust, any sun cream anything else that, that, that yes. might be there. Um, but no, any old, any old feet can, can do it because of course, at the end of the day, you're going to, that, that grape must is going to turn into alcohol um, and alcohol is, is a good cleanser, shall we say. <laughs> exactly. No, that's that's exactly it. No, no, I know, I know there, there, there are a lot of stories uh, or, or or, or ideas uh, around, around this, but uh, but as you say, I mean, you you just you clean your feet, and and, and it's a, such an amazing experience. Even the, um, the 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 feeling, the feeling of being, you know, in this in this place, and 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 crushing the the grip, and it's very tiring, very tiring. People think, I mean, so after basically what what usually happens is that uh, people who work in the vineyard during the day. Uh, picking the grapes at the end of the day uh, because it, it is done so that all the grapes are, are put in the lagarge and at the end of the day they still go to the lagar to uh, to um, to work and to and to do that for an hour which is or more which is which is very tiring so yeah yes anyone who who does their stepping exercises will will know that actually you know to to do some exercises stepping for a a few minutes is fine but a whole hour or more it's yeah. actually quite hard so they yeah. they help by having music 
Um, it's not ex even at one stage. Sometimes they start dancing when they've done the hard work. But um, no, it's it's a wonderful experience, and I've noticed one or two people commenting that they've they've had the experience themselves. I would certainly recommend it if you ever get the chance. But it does stain your feet a bit, depending on how long you're in that. You know, port um, port grapes are very dark in colour, uh, so uh, you don't necessarily want to be wearing your prettiest sandals after after treading grapes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's second. Okay, that's we should true. we should um, we should probably move on to the next region, which is Bayrada. So we're back to a coastal region again now. So we're, we're more or less halfway down, not quite halfway down Portugal. And Bairada is a small region um, on the Atlantic side of the country. Um, and the vast majority of the producers here are smaller producers. It's a more... It's marginal in a different way, I suppose. They are certainly challenged by being so close to the Atlantic. Um, and they have a particular red grape called the Baga grape, um, which is quite, a, it's quite a challenging grape with which to make wine. Luckily, the white grapes are not quite so challenging. Uh, and we have a lovely example of a white Bairada this evening from a young producer called Vadio. That's probably not how you say it. How do you pronounce it, anne uh, Vadio. Vadio. Yeah, the accent is on the I, Vadio, which means, oh, I should, I should obviously have um, um, looked for the translation. Vadio means um, someone who is wandering around, you know, who is, who is um, uh, I, I'll look. I'll look for the for the the right translation. But it's uh, yeah, it's 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 quite a a, a funny name actually. It's quite a funny mm -hmm. name. No, I didn't realize. Oh, super. Well, it's a it's a young winemaker. As our note says, it's a young winemaker who used to be one of the winemakers at Eschbrau in the Alentejo region. Yeah. For many years, um, but the property is a family property. It was tiny. So he used to go home at the weekends to help his, his father and, and prior to that grandfather um, making a little bit of wine, but ultimately took the decision to um, return to, the, to the, the family property and make that his work. He also does some consulting for, for other people, um, but yeah. he's, he's gradually over the last few years, he's built up to... Um, about seven hectares of vineyard, either his own vineyard or uh, leased vineyards. Um, and he's certainly one of the exciting young generation in the region, um, doing wonderful, wonderful things. And um, actually there's a, a, a wine to look out for in the summer. We've, we've, we've got lots of, um, lots of Portuguese wines coming in for an offer that we're doing in August including a sparkling wine from Vadio. Um, the, 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 the sparkling, it's, a, it's the sparkling rosé, actually, um, which I thought was absolutely delicious. So uh, look the, out. The region, yeah, the, the, re, the region is actually, I mean, Bairada, uh, the region is actually the region where in Portugal we produce some of the best um, sparkling wines. It is known for, for sparkling wines as well. Um, and so just a, fun, a funny fact about it, Bayrada, the name, comes from the word Bahu, and Bahu means clay, which is actually, so the, so the soils in Bayrada are mostly uh, clay, uh, which obviously influences uh, the, profile, the profile of the wine. So you were talking about Baga, the red grape, very tannic, uh, some people used to say that the old baga, I mean, the way that young winemakers used to work baga was that you couldn't drink it for 10 or 15 years. Uh, you had to wait until it would smooth. Obviously, it's not, not the case anymore. Um, and so baga is such an exciting and exciting grape. And the whites from the region are particularly amazing, food-friendly, very complex, um, so it's, it's, it's actually, I mean, really, I mean, if you, look, if you want to look for something um, really, you know, interesting, structured, uh, 
I mean, Bayhada is definitely a, a place to, to choose your white from, definitely. Um, and so, yes, about, about the project itself, yeah, Luis and Eduardo, it's a couple, a couple projects. So Eduardo is from Brazil, he's Brazilian. Oh, I didn't realize and, she was Brazilian. Uh, and they now have a beautiful baby boy. They do, yeah. They do. Yeah, she's Brazilian. So she's the only one in Portugal who her family and uh, they are still in uh, in Brazil. Um, and she's one of four. They are four sisters. So it's, uh, it's uh, very, always very interesting. And so Luis and her. So th the thing with Bajada is that it's almost impossible to get one big piece of land. So basically they've been buying plot by plot, uh, you know, uh, 0.2 hectare by 0.2 hectare. So it's, it's a lot of work. But the dad, Luis's dad, lives in Bajada, lives there. And so he's the one, you know, who is in contact with the smaller uh, uh, owners, you know, of vineyards and, and who sort of starts the negotiation. So um, I know that they, I think it's seven, almost 70% of their, um, of their vineyards, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, 70% of their wines are from their own vineyards and then they have to buy 30%. But then I know that they are looking at trying to get 100% to get to work only with their own their own grapes. Mm -hmm. So by hand, I would say it's, it's a bit, I mean, it's not an easy region in the sense that it's not really uh, touristic. Um, I mean, you have Coimbra, which is one of the biggest, um, with the third biggest city in Portugal, right in the middle of the region. But it's not really a place where people would easily go, I, I would say, you know, there's, there's no big touristic attraction there. But it's definitely a place to go. I mean, if you're looking for um, quiet, if you're looking for the, the tradition, the, 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 the real Portugal, I would, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have a few smaller cities there that are really nice. I don't know if you've ever been to Aveiro, which is really just south of, of Porto. So it's 60 kilometers south of Porto. Mm -hmm. Such, we, we call it the, it's the Portuguese Venice. So because it's all full of, of, um, of water so it's a, an amazing uh -huh. amazing city i would definitely recommend and it's, it's how do you good. how do you spell that it's a v i i r o a v i a v i no a v no a v e i r o Aveiro. okay yes Aveiro, yeah and um yeah no, so I, I must I, admit i i um i find i i love visiting Bayrada for, for that very reason. It's very quiet. There are no, you know, it doesn't have big hotels. It's, 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 um, you go to a restaurant, you wouldn't even realize it was a restaurant. It, it, it's just simple local fare, but really good. You can have really good food, but simple. Um, but for me, it's the, when you get out and see the vineyards, there are quite a lot of old vineyards and a lot of this younger generation, Luis is a, is a good example. Uh, Philippa Bato is another example, who are really working hard to, um, to restore those old vineyards and um, extend their life if, if they possibly can, um, but make sure that we keep that, that high quality vine material. But I visited some absolutely magical vineyards there. It, if anything, it's... It, it this, the, the tiny parcels that you talk about, it, it's a, maybe it's a little bit like Burgundy, maybe it's a little bit like Northern Italy, where you have tiny parcels of exceptional vineyards. Um, and I heard Luis explaining how, just how difficult it is to buy vineyard. You know, if you're a young producer and you want to start out or you want to grow, you just have to have patience and persistence, talk to the locals, Exactly. And, and if they if they respect you and they like what you do and they realize that you're serious about what you do, then maybe they'll consider to sell you some vineyard. Uh, yeah. that, that's why I mentioned the father, because mm -hmm. his role is usually important. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> of negotiating, you know, with the local uh, with yeah. the local owners. So, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Agree with you. Yeah, I, I love the, the wines from from this region. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites. Yeah. So this, this wine gives us two more grapes. So it's Bical, 
um, which is, is it's, a, it's beautifully fresh. So actually both the grapes in, in this wine give you good acidity. Bical is not always very aromatic, but it really gives you that a really beautiful purity, minerality, linear quality, and certainly freshness. Yeah. Um, and then the other grape um, is Celsial. Um, but it's just for, for, for the sake of clarification, it's nothing to do with the Celsial from Madeira. It's a, it's a different spelling, different grape. Um, but again, and it's, it's typically, it has a kind of, again, freshness, but citrusy, even a clight, slightly minty character. Mm. It's quite a delicate aroma, um, but for me, very pretty, very pure. And then just very elegant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Okay. That's good. Any particular questions on Barada, Catherine? Before we move on? No, not from Barada particularly. So if we move on to the next okay. one, we've got some for the end. Okay, excellent. Right. So with the last of the whites, we're actually now dropping quite a bit further south. Um, we're down in the Stubal region. So we are southeast of, of Lisbon. Um, and it's an, it's an area that's actually historically much better known for Moscatel, what we would pronounce as Moscatel, the, um, the sweet fortified muscats. Um, and there are some very, very fine examples there, as well as the, um, the very reasonable example that we, we, we're currently offering. Um, but this wine... Um, comes from the Adega de Pegos, which is a cooperative. And in this case, it's a, it's a true, quite sizable cooperative. They, they are responsible for over a thousand hectares of vineyard, close to 150 growers. And the winemaking over, is overseen actually by the same man who oversees the winemaking or the production at the privately owned Casa Ermelinda Freitas, which is not very far away, uh, who are making the new Society's Portuguese Red, which we've only introduced last, last autumn. And they have wines, in fact, I've occasionally bought wines from them similar to this wine. So it's, it's a style that is, I think they've perfected. We've been selling this wine for quite a number of years. And it's a wine that my former colleague, uh, Janet Wynne Evans, really enjoyed. Uh, Janet has, has a great palate for uh, fine, fine wines as well, but she really liked this wine because she's a great foodie and she found it a very adaptable food wine. Um, it's a blend of several grape varieties, for, uh, five different grape varieties, four um, native grapes and just a splash of Chardonnay, which somehow helps to just pull it all together um, and helps as well, I think, with that bit of barrel fermentation. So you can, you can definitely, if you're, if you're tasting the wine or if you know the wine, you can definitely pick up the oak on this wine, both on the nose and on the palate. Um, it's not a wine that I personally would sit just as a wine on its own. Um, it's a wine to have with food, but as I say, a very adaptable one at that. Um, that's Stunning photo, Anna Sophia, that you said. That's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it's a, it's um, so it's 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 a region that is, I mean, one of the big characteristics. So it's it's south of Lisbon, so on the other side of the bridge of, of the of the river, um, and obviously it's a region where you can find quite a lot of beaches. So it's sandy soils, which obviously gives here um, a, as well um, some specific characteristics. And you have the influence of this of this mountain uh, mountain here. I was trying obviously to remind the name, but it will it will come. Um, anyway, so it's yeah you you can tell, and you have you know amazing sunsets, and it's it's a, it's really a beautiful beautiful region. A bit um, as you were saying, I think it is known for Moscatel uh, because it's Moscatel de Setubal, and and it's it's obviously a big a, a big thing. 
Um, but it's such it's such an amazing region to produce, you know, uh, wines that are just pleasers. You know, people mm -hmm. absolutely enjoy uh, um, the Peniche de Setúbal wines. And in Portugal, more and more consumers. I mean, there are uh, numbers show how. Uh, sales of Peniche de Setúbal wines have been have been really increasing over the last four to five years. Mm -hmm. I would say it's the result of two different things. The first one is more and more I mean, good winemakers have been working in the region and doing really good wines. And the second one is, I think, the fact that um, it used to be quite a traditional region. And, and with traditional labeling and a bit of traditional winemaking. And I think that it has, it, it, this has definitely been changing over, over the, last, uh, the last few years with you know, new exciting uh, produce, producers with you know, uh, labels that are a bit more modern, et cetera. So this, this one is, is, a, is, a, is an, an iconic wine in Portugal. You, would, you will find it if you travel to Portugal, you will find it very easily, absolutely everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it is, you know, a wine that, yeah, so easy to enjoy. I really love. I mean, Jaime, who is the the winemaker you you were talking about uh, from Pegonge, from the Cobb, and from Ermolinda, the other private winery. Mm -hmm. He is such a clever, clever winemaker. I mean, he, I know he tastes a lot. He travels. I mean, when when it was possible to travel, he travels a lot. He tastes a lot. Mm -hmm. And he's really, um, I mean, he really wants to make wines that, you know, people will enjoy. And I think that's his objective. He, he started his career with one of, a, of the biggest winemakers in Portugal called João Portugal Ramos. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. worked with, with him in the past or not, mm -hmm. but he, I mean, obviously it's, it's one of the, the big ones. And he, he used to work with him and he learned with João. So I can, I can tell here that there is something similar to them, that he's this sort of interest in producing wines that people will enjoy and love drinking so that's really the objective um obviously working with with what portugal has so with Portu with grapes and portuguese portuguese grapes mainly so as you were saying there's a there's a bit like 10 percent of chardonnay in this one but because maybe as you were saying as well maybe because it it, it has some wood and it, it, uh, it stays in, mm -hmm. in, in barrels a, a bit of time, so Chardonnay is good for that. Um, but I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always so respectful for, you know, winemakers who will have this talent, because it is a talent to actually, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know, I've never asked him actually, but I should, you know, ask him if, if you were producing a wine you enjoy yourself, you know, as a selfish man, what, mm -hmm. what would that be? And uh, because that's interesting, obviously, when you work in a co-op and you have so many smaller viticulturists, you know, dependent on you and on the work you are developing, um, it is a huge responsibility, I have to say. And, and he's, he's managing it perfectly. And, and Pegonge, I would say in Portugal, you have two, I mean, we have quite a few co-ops maybe two or three that are doing an amazing job and Peguanche is definitely one one of them yeah. definitely I think any of those you know and and this this would be a good example I think any large producer who can make big volumes of such consistently good wine is to be admired you know it's definitely. it's not so difficult to make a really top wine in a small quantity um, but in a in a cooperative setting, and when you're making big volumes, big tanks, yeah. um, it, it's it's a whole different ballgame. So yeah, it's it's a, it's a very professional operation, um, and he's he's not only an impressive guy, but he's a lovely guy as well. Actually, he's a really really nice, yeah. person, you know, which is which is great. Um, so it's it's super that this is you know it's a it's a one of the popular wines in our range, um, and uh, yeah, it's good. It's good to, to try. Yeah. It might well go well with our chicken that we're having tonight, I have to say. <laughs> sounds sounds the good. The other thing, of course, really. about the, the region, it's, it's one of the closest to Lisbon as well. So I'm, I guess, you know, a lot of wine tours, people will travel out from Lisbon quite easily to, yes. uh, to this region. 
Yeah, yeah, it it is it is easy. And 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 apart from, I mean, if you if you're staying in Lisbon, definitely it's worth. I mean, the other side of the river is definitely worth a visit. So on the wine side, you will find a few a few wine producers with you know um, uh, wineries to visit, and it it's all very professional and organized. You will find amazing food um uh with you know seafood and lots of fish uh, on, on that on that area i would say and beaches that are amazing and even the, the small smallest you know cities that are just really delightful that it's a it's a it's a really a place to go if you want to escape from lisbon and and and, and enjoy you know a bit of um, a bit of nice countryside i would say and, and close to lisbon yeah mm -hmm. definitely Okay, so should we, any, any um, specific questions we should address now? Uh, no, nothing for the moment. So if we go on to the uh, port tonic, I've just prepared. Okay, that. shall we go on to the port? Right. We thought, although we are talking about white wines, we thought it would be very remiss not to actually um, talk a little bit about white port as well, because of course white port is made from white grapes and pretty much the same white grapes as the dry white Douro that we that we were talking about earlier. Um, so the I mean there may be one or two additional grapes included in there um, but fundamentally it's the, the typical white grapes of the Douro, high planted, uh, picked for freshness um, and then yeah turned into a port and this this particular one is the Graham's fine white. Um, they do another, another one which I have been very tempted by on and off. Um, they do a wine called the Extra Dry White, um, which is sold locally in Portugal. But it is drier, which honestly is one reason why I liked it. Uh, and I like it especially on its own, unmixed. But actually, it doesn't travel so well it doesn't say fresh as well when you when you export it so they don't export it to as many as many countries um this one does have a bit of sweetness it's not overly sweet but it's got a bit of sweetness and that just does help actually to keep the wine so i have a little taste empty my glass first i'm going to have a little taste just of the port because of course it's a wine that you can drink straight, you know, straight, pour straight from the bottle, doesn't have to be mixed. Um, it's certainly good to chill it, however you're, however you're serving it. Um, yeah, and that's, you certainly can perceive the sweetness, you can perceive having been, having been tasting um, table wines, you can certainly perceive the extra weight in this wine. But it's, it's aromatic, it's fresh, Got some nice kind of herby, herby notes to it, herby character. Mm. And it's very smooth. There's no, it's white port is, well, this particular one is 19% alcohol, I think. Yeah, 19%. And they'll, they'll be there or thereabouts. Um, so it's not, um, it's not high in alcohol, but clearly, you know, you're going to you're going to notice the difference between that and a and a regular wine. But what I think, um, you know, and I, I first discovered it many years ago, and and so many more people are going to Portugal now and discovering the long drink, so a white port mixed with tonic. And I've got a few little. Um, my husband very kindly just brought me some ice. Um, so I'm going to pop a bit of the port onto the ice and basically you mix it according to your taste. But if you use the same kind of measure that you would to make a gin and tonic, for example, that generally turns out to be a nice mixture. And then I'm popping in a little bit of lime rind because I didn't happen to have any lemon but I've got some some citrus rind and I've got a little bit of fresh rosemary and I've got a little bit of fresh mint and 
I'm going to put in a bit of tonic. Ian, you couldn't grab some tonic, could you? <laughs> <laughs> Your sounds very sweet. I can't believe it. I forgot the tonic. I've got everything but the tonic. <laughs> tonic is on its way. I will continue to make the second glass because my husband has earned it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a popular... It's a popular drink, well, particularly in the Dura, which is where I first experienced it and enjoyed it. But I've enjoyed it in, in restaurants throughout Portugal, particularly in Porto, but elsewhere as well. Ana Sofia, do you, how widely is it consumed? I, I'm assuming it's not just drunk. No, in, no, no. In no, 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 Portugal. no, no. No, but but having said that, it's not it's not traditional. It is something that I would say came uh, or appeared, you know, in wine in bars, and and um, I would say maybe five years ago, but stronger now in the in the in the so in 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 Lisbon, um, no one would you know have a a, a port tonic, you know, in a, a few years ago. So now it's just it's just an alternative to gin. Obviously, there are so many gins you know out there that you you could you could spend your life really drinking different genes so I, I get that I mean I don't think the port wine industry is trying to uh, compete um, well with, with the, the with the spirits you know which obviously have lots of money to promote themselves and blah 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 but I just think it's a, it's an amazing alternative if you want to drink something that is um good quality that is wine actually <laughs> because that's the, the old point of it is that you're actually drinking you know a, a grape juice i mean a, a, i mean a wine so made from grape um so it's, it's an amazing alternative and it's it's just one of the alternatives that people have when when they go out and they, they want something uh, refreshing so i think that's the way it should be seen um and and that's the way I, the way i see it so it's obviously you know you that it, the, the, the possibilities are are uh, um, well huge, um, and but what I, what I think is also interesting is that it sort of came to bring a new life to White Port because White Port was a bit forgotten mm -hmm. uh, because obviously of vintage tawnies uh, and you know all these all, all these these ports. So White Port was sort of the you know, category that no one would actually uh, talk about. So nowadays, obviously, you, you've got you've got white port for the port tonic specifically, and then you have so many producers now interested in in, in producing um, older aged white ports, and you know, it's it, because it is you can definitely tell the difference between a, a, a white port and and a, a a port made from from wet red grapes. So it's um. I think it's it's just it's fascinating, you know, all the possibilities. Obviously, the port wine industry is trying to op, to get to other customers, um, and, mm -hmm. and 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 I, I get that, and I I really don't blame them. I think it's I think that's a good way to do it. So to sort of make people, because here in Portugal, which is something quite interesting. I don't know if I should say that, but it's we don't really drink port. We I mean it's not part. I mean. No, I, I know. believe you said that. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. I mean, no, but it is very traditional to buy a good bottle of port for Christmas. Mm -hmm. It is traditional to offer a port, but it's. I mean, the port industry is struggling because not enough people drink port, and and we should drink port. That's the same everywhere. I know. Well, uh, but. I guess, you know, and anything that will encourage um, people to experiment a little more. So, you know, perhaps it was the, you know, the two big um, historically British houses that introduced the port and tonic. It's such a deliciously refreshing drink when you're up in the heat of the Douro. Um, and the other advantage, of course, is depending on how you pour it, it's about half the alcoholic punch of a gin and tonic. So... Exactly. Had some advantages too, um, exactly. but I, but I think yes, I think it's it's obviously the you know the whole port category has been working really hard to um, to attract a new particularly a new generation of drinkers. But I remember it was only 
Only a few years ago, I was 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 visiting in in producers in in the region, and they were saying, actually, the the rise of tourism has created a demand that in Whiteport that they hadn't planned for, hadn't expected. You know, they certainly weren't promoting Whiteport that way, but people visiting, particularly Porto and the and the port houses and and tasting white port, well, tasting the range of ports, all of a sudden the demand for, for white port was increased. And one of the advantages of that, not, not only are they selling more wine, which is making them happy, but it means that the turnover is faster. So the wines, wines like this, which are lighter, meant for early drinking, you know, th- this is... Yeah. Not one of the serious wines that you were referring to just now, Anasphere, which where they will have a darker colour, they have longer oxidation, uh, kept longer in the cask, and then they keep really well. Something like this needs to be drunk when it's young and fresh. And if there's a bigger demand and a bigger turnover, that means that the bottle that you open is going to be uh, fresher when you buy it. So yeah, it's, it's all good news, really. It is. Yeah, yeah. No, and and I think it's um, we we what I was trying to say without you know that with the fact that you know we don't we don't drink port obviously we do but we not enough I, I mean there are so many occasions you know where we could we could so I think it's it's just a good way to create um to create and to have a new one um I mean I I I I am Portuguese both my parents are Portuguese but I was born in France and I lived in France for many many years and in France port is a is a big thing it's a big thing to to start the aperitif, you know, with port. So it's uh, it's definitely it's definitely a tradition and something that that exists. I was just saying that we don't really have this this tradition in Portugal, even in Portugal, because we're not very big in aperitif anyway. It's a very French thing, but but um, but we, you know, it's it's interesting, and that's mm-hmm. what what I'm saying is that I think uh, I, I I respect a lot the producers who are really trying to. Uh, find new customers for for port because it is such uh, an amazing tradition such such an amazing wine i mean port is really uh unique so we we, we don't want it to, to be drunk only by a few uh happy few who, who can you know enjoy it so we, it's definitely something we can we can drink whenever we we want and and in different ways and so i think it's a great mm-hmm. idea to show this uh this port tonic because it's it, well, and again, it's it's a possibility. It's another possibility, and if you want to to uh, vary from the the typical GNT, I think it's a good I think it's a good option. Very good yeah. option. So, Catherine, do we have a little time left for a few questions? We do. Yes, we've got a few questions. Um, and we've got some time. So, members, we will answer though, a few of those now. Um, if you do have to uh, hop off, if you have to get to dinner or something. You will be able to catch up with the recording tomorrow. And I think the first question that we can um, address perhaps is we've had a lot of people asking about food matches for the wines. Now I'd imagine a lot of them will have some similarities perhaps to say the the Adega de Pagos with that extra texture will maybe be slightly different. You can have maybe something a bit more richer but the others being that that fresh crisp acidity that we get from the white wines. What sort of things would you would you suggest as having alongside that to eat? Can I pass that one to you, Anna Sophia? I mean, you, you've <laughs> talked about fish in Portugal. I've had some of the best fish I've ever eaten yes. in Portugal. I think one of, yeah. the, one of the good characteristics that you Portuguese share with the French is that you really care about your food. You really care, care about the, the quality and freshness of your food. So certainly fish, but but. Do you have particular? Yes, I, w- I, w- I mean the the, the 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 thing for me that is quite cr- so as you were saying that's true. We are we are quite good in a few things. So one of them is seafood. We have amazing seafood, and and for seafood, I would definitely go with the the alo, the sualiero, the first pino verde, because because it doesn't get in the way. Just accompanies, let's say, what we're eating without uh, uh, struggling and, and fighting with, with what we're eating. So I think it's mm-hmm. a perfect, perfect match. Having said that, the aloe has the other advantage to be, to be drunk on its own, which, which is obviously something quite, quite good as well. Uh, maybe for the pegonge, 
uh, I would imagine um, a, a richer, yeah, a richer uh, fish. So it could be octopus, it could be codfish, but what, what, whatever fish that you might have and cooked in oven or eventually in, in, with a sauce, that would definitely work. Mm -hmm. um, and even with, with some light meat, definitely with salad or chicken or you know that would definitely work. for the two in the middle let's say so for the, the doro the feituri and the vadio because they they are quite similar obviously my my choice would definitely go for grilled fish we are so good uh, at, at at grilling fish i think it's an art and and i have a few you know a, a few spots where i know that they know how to grill the fish and i think it's something you can't I mean, I can't even bother to, 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 to try to cook fish at home because I, I would never be able to reproduce, you know, the, the, the crispiness, the salt, the whatever. I mean, it's just perfect. So I would say these two would, would work perfectly well with, with, um, with, a, grilled, uh, with a grilled fish. Um, but obviously, I mean, gastron, I mean, food is something so typical. You, 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 it's hard to find... Uh, 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 Portuguese food in, in, in the UK, uh, but I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure, no, I know, and I've had amazing fish in restaurants, so that there, there are amazing fish, so that you could, you could definitely, you could definitely get that. Yeah, but as a, as a, as a guide, as a guideline, I would say seafood for the first one, or on its own, creamy or baked, oven baked for the last white, for pegonish, and the two in the middle, so, so a lighter fish in a way that, you know, grilled or, yeah, not, not as rich uh, on, 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 the, on the style, I would, I would say, yeah. Wonderful. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Absolutely. The, uh, the next question we've had, we've had this from um, a couple of people, actually. And the question is about the, um, whether Portuguese wines nowadays are leaning towards being produced in a more organic or biodynamic way um, and whether Portugal is as advanced as Spain when it comes to organic wines. Do you, I, I can, I can, I have, I have, I have a, an opinion and a, and a few data about it. Um, okay. So there are, there are, so it's, it's different. So biodynamic, organic, and then natural, which is another, some, some, something different. From the producers we've, we've had today, a few are actually working and, and organic, which is the case of Suadiairo and the case of Vadio. Um, uh, the, the, these two are, are, are working organically. So it's, um, it's more, it's, so it's a, there, there's a market uh, needs for that. So the market is asking for organic. So producers are, on one, one hand responding to a demand, but on the other hand, lots of them were already uh, uh, working that way in the, in the vineyard. So they are certified, we have several entities certifying the wines um, and, and, and working very well on, on that sense. Biodynamic, we have a few, but I wouldn't say a huge amount uh, uh, at all. Uh, and on the natural side, and for me, natural. And I know it's poetic, so I, I, I don't want to, to to go really there. But what the only thing I want to say is that, uh, for for from what I've seen, and because it is something that really interests me, the natural wine wine scene, uh, Portugal is really doing very very well with a lot a lot of new young producers who travelled, uh, who have seen a lot of things, and then come back to Portugal, and and get, you know, go to their family vineyard or go to wherever and then, and then work that way, trying to, have, you know, low intervention in the, in the vineyard um, and producing wine that is uh, a sort of pure product of, of, of what the, the nature uh, is giving with obviously their, their own intervention, but in a, in a natural way so no, no, with no chemicals and no... So, the wine, it's so exciting. I can't, I can't tell you, I was talking about, you know, the fact that obviously I live here, I'm, I work in wine and I'm, I'm always, you know, looking for uh, new producers. I just can't know all of them. Every day there is a new, a new small producer uh, doing an exciting thing, 
in up north in Portugal, in Traz dos Montes, uh, you know, really uh, just amazing, amazing. And and um, I, I like I like I like skin contact. I like maceration. Lots of producers are doing this now very successfully. And obviously, again, that's the same. Uh, that, that's what I was saying earlier. The playground is just fantastic because you have so many grapes. And if you can play yeah. with them you know, in different ways, it's really exciting. So on the organic production, uh, um, uh, let's say only, uh, I think there are more and more producers uh, certifying their wines are working organically. Obviously it takes time to do the transition between, between uh, non-organic and conventional, as they say, and, and organic. But um, so it takes time to produce those. But 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 still, uh, a, a lot of them are, are are doing are doing it. I don't know if that's your experience, Joe. If you see that in the producer you're working with, I think we're seeing. I'm certainly seeing a bit of a trend in Portugal, but similar actually in other parts of the world. That I think there is increasing interest and in an increasing movement in that direction. I think what we often see is that people work that way, but they don't necessarily go as far as certification not least because certification is complicated and expensive. You know, there's quite a cost attached as well as the extra work involved. Yeah. Um, but there is definitely a movement in that direction. And I think ultimately it will be market led, you know, if, if, if um, because there are also quite a lot of producers who work organically and are certified, but who don't put it on the label. Um, mm. And a lot of the time that's because they don't want people to think that they're doing it purely for marketing reasons. They're doing it for philosophical yeah. reasons and for policy reasons. Um, but we're we're kind of moving through, you know, that that whole subject is maturing, if you like. Yeah. Um, but I think the I think the good news is that a step back from that, Portugal actually has its own. Um, system of sustainable production, um, including one or two certification bodies. Integrated production is the one that springs immediately to yeah. mind. Yeah. So actually there's, there's a very high standard of, well, the production standards are very high um, in Portugal generally. Um, so, you know, which I think is a really good thing. And I think that'll, that'll only grow. Yeah, and, and, and just to add on that, uh, so there's um, a region, uh, so Alentejo, which we, we didn't taste today, but um, we, which has a, uh, which was the first one to have a, a sustainability program in place for the region and for the, for the producers. And I know that uh, Portugal is working nationally for a program based on, on that, on that you know, sustainable, sustainability program from Alentejo, which is a great news because mm -hmm because it is needed. And, and, and as you were saying, uh, a few producers uh, are actually not choosing to certify, uh, to, I mean, to actually have the certification, uh, but are working that way uh, and in a sustainable way for many, many years. So yeah, that, mm -hmm. that's definitely, it's more than a trend. I think it's a necessity people, I mean, again, uh, winemakers are, uh, you know, people working, you know, in the field, in the vineyard, and, and, and they, they are the first ones to see the consequences of pollution or um, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So they are very, very aware of, of, of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you. I think for our last question is one that we've had from, uh, from James. He's, it's a question for you, Anna. He's asking, what is your um, go-to local region? for red and white wine in Portugal? What are your go-tos? Oh my God, it's, it's always, it depends on the occasion to be completely honest, but if I want to be, well, if I had to choose, if I had to choose, I would say, uh -huh, I would say by harder for the whites, because I, I just love the whites from Bajada. I think they are absolutely fulfilling. I never get tired and, and you drink them and then uh, the same bottle then has evolution and you have one glass, but the other glass is different. And I obviously has a, a wine lover, I, I love it. For reds, um, I, have, I think I would say down, which is a region we, 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 we didn't have to tonight, but uh, down, which is close to by so it's the, it's another region really um, close to Bajada. It's in the center of Portugal. 
I just love the elegance and 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 again and and obviously here in Portugal and I love old wines, white or red, and I'm lucky enough because in Portugal we've got lots and lots of old wines. Um, so uh, I don't know. I mean, the the, the, the actually the, the the oldest white wine I had was from Bayhada, and it was 1950 something, and it was still alive. And I love that. I love it. Was from Cave Saint Juan, and it just—it's such an experience. It's just absolutely amazing. And and we've got and we can find old wines from the down uh, from the down region. And um, I I just I I just love them. There is a bit of a I don't know if you know about um, one of the most well known Portuguese red grapes, which is Toriga Nacional. And there's a bit of a battle between the Douro and the Down to say this is the origin of this grape is from Down, or the origin of this grape is from the Douro. I would, I could really imagine that the origin of the of the grape is from Down, uh, because I think the characteristics of the grape and it, I mean, it's just absolutely fantastic and beautiful in that region. So, yeah, so I, I would, I would be a very, you know, a girl from the the center of Portugal, and I would say by Hada and Down. <laughs> Um, which I mean, I think they are exciting, um, exciting regions when when you love wine. Yeah. Well, we're hoping to maybe do um, another event like this, but for the red wines of Portugal, so a bit later in the year, so we can uh, can have a little experiment with that. Sounds good. <laughs> the very last question that we've got, because we've had um, a couple of people just ask it. Now, I don't know if there'll be a, a simple answer to this, but it. Um, a question on the cork industry in Portugal and how well it's doing now that we're seeing screw caps be a bit more prevalent with the wines. Of the wines this evening, obviously only one has been by screw cap, but it is becoming more common to see. Is that an effect on the cork industry that we're going to see? Well, of course, there is an effect in the fact that uh, obviously if, if more if more if more wines are are uh, topped with screw caps, obviously. It means less less cork pre, uh, sold, so it is a problem for the the cork industry. Having said that, it is um, you as as you know people who live in the UK have to be aware that uh, the the reality of your market is not the reality of all other markets, and so the fact that um, producers are actually asked to uh, to to um, to bottle their wines with screw caps for specifically for certain markets and the UK is one of them. In Portugal, uh, n never. I mean, you would the same wine would exist, but without the screw cap and with, with a cork. It's just a a cultural thing, obviously. So, um, from what I know, and and I know a bit of, about the cork industry. It is um, obviously suffering and, and, and aware of the problems that cork can bring to a wine. And, and, and they, they've been addressing this with lots of investment. Um, but it is, it's just something cultural. It's just something that in certain markets, it, it is totally acceptable or even something people want. Uh, and in other markets, it's just something people reject totally. For me, um, has, again, as, as a wine consumer, um, I don't see why uh, a wine that you know you will drink, you know, in the in the year, why it it could so it, it wouldn't shock me, and I would I would buy a, a wine from Scotland. But obviously, I do work in the UK a lot. I travel mm -hmm. quite a lot, so I, you know, maybe I I don't have these you know these ideas and 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 uh, that that some people uh, uh, may have. But again, the UK is very specific uh, concerning this reality. Um, which, which is not the case in, in other markets. Even the US, for example, uh, react differently to, to the cork. So, so the cork, I mean, we still, Portugal is still uh, the country um, that exports, uh, that produces and exports the most uh, cork. Uh, so it's Portug Portugal and Spain that are battling, but Portugal is, is ahead, let's say, slightly uh, on, this, on, this, um, on this sector. But, um, I think the old tradition that is involved. I, I, I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to convince anyone. I think. I think there is room for absolutely everything in the on the market, uh, for every occasion. I just think that every people that has, and I have been with journalists 
uh, uh, visiting, you know, cork, cork production uh, sites. And when you see it and when you understand how it works, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a tradition. And, and the way the way the way the, 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 the tree leaves and has to leave so many years, it's such an investment. When you plant, you know, a cork tree, it takes you 20 to 25 years until you can actually get cork out of it. So it's 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 um I mean again I'm really respectful for the people in this in industry because it is it is not it is not easy and the people who work so it's it's a whole you know economy that lives around cork uh, that is so important for Portugal so I wouldn't uh, I would never you know uh, be against it and I think it's um it's hugely important and and part of the tradition but again mm -hmm. there's room for there's room for 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 screw cap and for other 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 are the solutions so in, in many ways i think the some of the new the, the more modern alternatives to uh natural cork whether it's screw cap or whether it's the um the technical cork options it's actually allowed a little breathing space to the cork forests and we are certainly seeing far less incidence of cork taint mm -hmm. and particular markets that used to complain about the quality of corks that they received. South Africa is one, it's part of my patch. So I used to hear it quite often yeah. from my makers over there. Um, they are now receiving far higher quality and more reliable yeah. supplies of natural cork from Portugal. So there are upsides to the technology that's competing with cork. And I think you're exactly right. I think there are, there's place for all of those options, well, certainly any of those options which are recyclable or sustainable in some way, um, I think there is there is a future for those things. I think anything that is not recyclable won't be around for too much longer, just because the world is is going in a in a in a different direction now. Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah. Okay, so we we probably I, I would love to go on chatting this evening and thank you all of you so so many of you for staying as long as you have, um, particularly any of you who've given up your football or maybe maybe um, maybe some of you were uh, escaping from the football I don't know are you a, Sophia, are you a, a true Portuguese are you a football fan? Yes, I have to say yeah we we won yesterday. Uh, yeah, with Aha, uh, okay. Hungary. Yeah, against Hungary. Yeah. A good start. Okay. Good start. So, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for giving up your evening, um, and and joining us this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat to you. Um, thank and you for what insights me. and 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 background and and knowledge of the of the wines, the places, the the industry, and I'm sure you've. You've whetted a few appetites to come and visit for those who haven't already, um, or to come again as soon as we can um, and visit. Um, one thing we didn't, we didn't touch on, and we can't get into the detail now, but of course the, there's, the, there's the amazing new um, city of wine in, 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 in Porto now, okay. yeah. which I haven't visited. I saw it in under construction, so even more reasons to go to Portugal when we can. and. Um, and, and enjoy a, a wonderful glass of Portuguese wine. Anna Sofia, thank you so much. Catherine and Bill and Tim behind the scenes, thank you so much for keeping things running smoothly. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Have a good